Chapter Nine of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Nine. There was nothing now to retard the journey, and Mary chose Lisbon rather than France on account of its being further removed from the only person she wished not to see. They set off accordingly for Falmouth, and they awaited that city. The journey was at use to Anne, and Mary's spirits were raised by her recovered looks. She had been in despair. Now she gave way to hope, and was intoxicated with it. On shipboard, Anne always remained in the cabin. The sight of water terrified her. On the contrary, Mary, after she was gone to bed, or when she fell asleep in the day, went on the deck, conversed with the sailors, and surveyed the ballast expanse before her with delight. One instant she would regard the ocean, the next the beings who brave its fury. The insensibility and want of her, she could not name courage. The thoughtless mirth was quite of an animal kind, and the feelings as impetuous and uncertain as the element it ploughed. There had only been a week, at sea, when they held the rock of Lisbon, and the next morning anchored to the castle. After the customary visits, they were permitted to go on shore, but three miles from the city, and while one of the crew, who understood the language, went to procure them one of the ugly carriages peculiar to the country, they waited in the Irish convent, which is situated close to the Tagus. So the people offered to conduct them into the church, where there was a fine organ playing. Mary followed them, but Anne preferred staying with the nun she had ended the conversation with. One of the nuns heard a sweet voice was singing. Mary was struck with awe. Her heart joined in the devotion, and there's a gratitude and tenderness flowed from her eyes. My father, I thank thee, burst from her. Words were inadequate to express her feelings. Silently she served at the lofty dome. Heard an accustomed sounds, and saw faces, strange ones, that she could not yet greet with fraternal love. In an unknown land, she considered that the being she adored inhabited eternity was ever present in unnumbered worlds, and she had not any one she loved near her. She was particularly sensible of the presence of her almighty friend. The arrival of the carriage put a stop to speculations. It was to conduct them to an hotel, fitted up for the reception of invalids. Unfortunately, before they could reach it, there was a violent shower of rain, as the wind was very high, it beat against the leather curtains, which they drew along the front of the vehicle, to shelter themselves from it, but it availed not. Some of the rain forced its way, and Anne felt the effects of it, for she caught cold spite of Mary's precautions. As is the custom, the rest of the invalids, or lodgers, sent to inquire after the health, and as soon as Anne left her chamber, in which her complaints seldom confined her to the whole day, they came persons to pay their compliments, three fashionable females and two gentlemen, the one the brother of the eldest of the young ladies, and the other an invalid, who came, like themselves, for benefit of the air. They entered into conversation immediately. People who meet in a strange country, and are altogether in house, soon get acquainted with the formalities which attend visiting in separate houses, where they are surrounded by domestic friends, and was particularly delighted at meeting with agreeable society. A little hectic fever generally made her less spirited in the morning, and lively in the evening, when she wished for company. Mary, who only thought of her, was a means to cultivate acquaintance, as she knew that if her mind could be diverted, her body might gain strength. They were all musical and proposed having little concerts. One of the gentlemen played on the violin, and the other the German flute. The instruments were brought in, with all the eagerness that attends putting a new scheme in execution. Mary has not said much, for she was diffident. She seldom joined in general conversations. The quickness of penetration enabled her soon to enter into the characters of those she conversed with and her sensibility made her desirous of pleasing every human creature. Besides, if her mind was unoccupied by any particular sorrow or study, she caught reflected pleasure, and was glad to see others happy, though the mirth did not interest her. This day she was continually thinking of Anne's recovery, and encouraging the cheerful hopes, which, though they dissipated the spirits that had been condensed by melancholy, yet made her wish to be silent. The music, more than the conversation, disturb her reflections, but not at first. The gentleman who played the German flute was a handsome, well-bred, sensible man, 
and his observations, if not original, were pertinent. The other, who had not said much, began to search the violin, and played the little scotch ballad. He brought such a thrilling sound of the instrument, that Mary started, and looking at him with more attention than she had done before, and saw, in a face rather ugly, strong lines of genius. His manners were awkward, that kind of awkwardness which is often found in literary men. He seemed a thinker, and delivered his opinions in elegant expressions and musical tones of voice. When the concert was over, they all retired to their apartments. Mary always slept with Anne, as she was subject to terrifying dreams, and frequently in the night was obliged to be supported to avoid suffocation. They chatted about their new acquaintance in their own apartments, and with respect to the gentlemen, differed in opinion. End of chapter 9